City Quartet. Got to know those men several years ago. Uh, we would do a annual January Bible study cruise, and uh, I got to know them on some of the cruises. Had the opportunity to preach in what I call the small end of the ship, while the known pastors were in the larger end of the ship. Uh, the uh, area that we had the privilege of preaching in would seat about 350, and the other one was about 650. Never will forget on one of them, we had gotten permission from the uh, folks that had put the cruise together to do some flyers and put them under the stateroom doors of all of the 1,500 people on board and uh, inviting them to come and to hear me preach uh, on the second coming of Christ. A very famous preacher, if I'd call his name, most would know it, got pretty bent out of shape because they had not put flyers out to invite folks to come to hear him preach. We had, and he thought that it was something that was wrong and ought not to have been done. And when he challenged me on that, I said, talk with the owners of the ship or the ones that have put the cruise on, not me. We were given permission to do so. And if you're jealous over that, that's your problem, not mine. But we had an opportunity to get to know the Gold City Quartet. They love the Lord and do a good job. I would take one picture out of that video if it were me because of his her heretical preaching, but that's their prerogative, not mine. But uh, I'll leave you to guess as to which one. Open your Bibles to Revelation, the 12th chapter. Revelation, chapter 12. We're going to read that ver those verses in a moment. In fact, uh, we'll read the 12 verses. During the course of this uh, time together, we're not going to exegete the 12 verses. We're using this text because of the heretical teaching that's been taking place now for about uh, a year, pointing to September the 23rd, 2017, when Christ is coming and the world is coming to an end. And they supposedly get that from Revelation 12, verse 1. Uh, they forget, neglect, and totally uh, do not see that in context as to the following verses. But I want us to understand we have a responsibility to preach the Word. I've said for many, many years, uh, as the Word is proclaimed, it's uh, the pastor's responsibility to honor the Word of God in context with the proper chronology, with the uh, dispensational theological understanding of what's being said. Unless that is done... We have Scripture rather than Scripture. And so I want us to understand the difference between Scripture and Scripture in this time together. Stand, if you will, please, out of honor and recognition of the reading of the Word. As I read audibly, follow with me in your Scripture silently. Revelation, the 12th chapter, the first 12 verses. I will then give a little brief blurb as to what it's about. And then I'll introduce the subject of the false teachers and the myth of September the 23rd, 2017, we'll deal with that and get back to the understanding of the text in the final portion of the message today. And there appeared a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pained to deliver and there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for, the, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child, who was to rule all nations, with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God that they should uh, feed her 3,203 score days. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and uh, his angels and prevailed not neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceived the whole world, he was cast into out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, 
Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death, the death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil is come down into the in to you unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short season or short time. Thank you, and we may be seated. An unusual thing when you look at the text and you understand in those few verses, in fact, In the 12th chapter of the book of the Revelation, I've called it down through the years, and I've had the privilege, I say this very humbly but very carefully, I've had the privilege of preaching through the book of the Revelation uh, 10, 11 times from the pulpit, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, in context with the word study as to what is being said. And when you look at the 12th chapter of the book of the Revelation, it's dealing with what I call the satanic conflict, or war in heaven, as I have chosen on some occasions to call it. And I've looked at it on the basis the heavenly wonders revealed, the heavenly war recorded, and the heavenly witness recited. Now, we're not going to exegete that text, but we're going to talk about it in a moment. After we have looked at the truth of what's happening in our society today that causes me to deal with this as an issue. Now, I know that there's some that will say, well, what's the point in dealing with this when we know that these naysayers, these uh, ones that say that what they're saying, uh, what these so-called, so-called prophets are saying, that they are men of God, that they understand the word, and they're simply trying to warn us. Well, I don't go along with that philosophy because when there's heresy, I believe the Bible calls the pastor the spiritual leader, the preacher, uh, with the responsibility of confronting that and calling it heresy and pointing out the error that we as believers might understand what God is saying to us and be obedient to the Word of God. We live in a day when it's not just confusion and chaos and corruption in the political world. It's also true of the religious world. Most believers today will readily agree when I make the statement that we're to preach the Word in context. We're to preach the word of God word for word because it has the final authority. Jesus himself said, thy word is truth. Outside the truth of the word of God, there is no truth. May I remind us, it's not just the source of truth. It is truth. It is truth without admixture or error. Yet we have multitudes of so-called believers in society today that will follow the latest fad, the latest Dr. Divine. By the way, I have to be careful with that. A number of years ago when Dr. Vines was a pastor here in our city, and I said that, someone thought that I was saying Dr. Vines. I said, and understand me, Dr. Divine. Uh, Those that will come with some, quote, divine message, uh, the latest new revelation or some new doctrine. The Bible warns us of false prophets and false prophecies and false Christ. And may I say almost annually, we see those coming on the scene with some new guru that will come up with some new thing. And generally these uh, fake prophecies supposedly find uh, some meaning in some astrological or geological events that have taken place or that shall take place. May I remind us, they then try to explain it with some biblical text out of context. Now I want us to realize and recognize that there are many Christians today that I believe are truly saved, but they're uh, immature, they are ignorant, and I use that in the right sense, they're ignorant of the Word of God and the truth of the Word of God, they're immature, and in that immaturity and ignorance of the Word, they're unlearned in the Scriptures, and therefore they fall prey to these uh, fake prophets for profit that's preaching today and bringing about some new revelation that no one else has ever found. These immature believers will follow these false teachers and the internet gurus. They will buy their books and watch their videos and stand in awe of what they have seen and what they have heard, notwithstanding the fact that it's simply not biblical. And may I remind us throughout the years this has been so. One of the problems that I find that is an irritant for me, if you've not recognized it, 
In fact, it's a, a difficulty that I uh, see because it angers me with righteous indignation is to find how many Christians that claim to be saved will spend their God-given dollars on the books and the videos and the heresy that's being proclaimed by these fake, false, phony prophets of today. May I remind us, most of them uh, simply are pointing out a new date, a new time of the rapture of the church or the return of Christ or the ultimate end of the world. You recall in 2012 through 2015, we had the false prophets about the four blood moons. These false prophets sold millions of books and raked in millions of dollars for movies and other false propaganda. Some of these uh, books were the Harbinger, the Shemitah, the four blood moons. May I remind us, Jonathan Kahn in his The Shemitah claimed that the final days of the Shemitah year would be a wipeout day according to Jewish belief. All these, he said, were linked together in that he claimed that something horrible would occur between 2014 in April and September the 28th of 2015. Didn't happen, did it? In fact, there's some preachers still fighting in legal battles on who originated the four blood moons. Both of them claimed that NASA gave them the information. NASA says they gave neither of them the information. Khan, in fact, predicted a financial meltdown, saw social chaos, and perhaps even Jesus' return in September the, uh, of 2015. And now comes these new false prophecies that claim the eclipse of August the 21st, 2017 would be the trigger of the return of Christ. I don't know if you knew that. When the eclipse took place, by the way, it was only in America that the eclipse was seen. It was only in a belt across America that it was uh, a total eclipse. And some of these uh, uh, gurus said that uh, it was the, the eclipse was being seen across the beltway of America in the areas of America that predominantly voted for uh, Donald J. Trump. That's in Hezekiah 4.4 in your Bible. <laughs> or in the book of opinion, the 14th chapter. And uh, we uh, have those that will come up with all kind of uh, uh, sayings and uh, bring it into the picture that this is supposed to have some meaning. May I remind us that uh, Christ was supposed to return and there was supposed to be some global uh, destruction on September the 23rd of 2017, according to these fake false prophets uh, for profit. The beginning of Elul, El Al, that is, in the Jewish calendar, uh, is uh, something that, according to these same false prophets of today, the August the 21st, 2017, was the first day of El Al on the Jewish calendar. And it's the beginning of 40 days of uh, uh, a time of repentance. Now, mind the fact that that would be applicable only to Jewish people under Jewish custom, culture, and law. But it's taken out of its context and applied to America only. And according to these gurus, by the way, if you did not read that, this 40 days of repentance was only for America. But at the conclusion of the 40 days, thereabouts, would be September the 23rd, 2017, which would be the return of Christ. Now, why is it, if that is true, that only America is to repent before the return of Christ? Why is it that it only pointed to that beltway that voted for Donald J. Trump that's supposed to repent? And yet these gurus have been filling the blogs and uh, covering as a blanket on the Internet and some even on radio and Christian broadcasting as it is called today. It's going to be the final judgment of the world according to these gurus on September the 23rd, 2017, and the return of Christ. Now, I want us to understand that early on that I can tell you the date that Jesus Christ will not come back. September the 23rd, 2017. I know that because God's Word says so. Where does it say so? It says so in Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, 37, 38, and 39. It says that only the Father in heaven knows the day and the hour. 
uh, not even the angels in heaven, the angelos, the messengers, if you please, in heaven. May I remind us, just as the fake, fake false prophets and the false prophecies of the four blood moons, these phonies are seeing God's sovereign control of our universe and supposing to have some extraordinary insight into the sun and the moon and the stars and the planets. So the question ought to be asked, just as uh, was asked so long ago by an individual, how should we then live? How should we then live? What should be our response? Should we just simply take it and say, well, you know, after they made all of these predictions and prophecies and people have spent millions of dollars to buy their videos and buy their books and listen to them, etc., it has amazed me the number of otherwise so-called Christians that will pick up the telephone and call and say, Preacher, do you know what's going to happen on September the 23rd this year? No, tell me. And then they'll start telling you what they've heard on the Internet or what someone has called them and told them. And they get all excited about that, but you don't see them in the pews of the church. I'm perturbed by that. Believers are taken with the blogs and the books and the babble, as I call it, due to the ineptness and the anemia in their Christian walk and understanding of the word. Even some unlearned, uh, ignorant pastors are taken up with this and start uh, mimicking what they have read or seen or heard from their pulpits as though it is absolute biblical fact. God's word is very, very clear about date setting. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only, Matthew 24 and verse 36. So I call this several things, exposing the September the 23rd, 17 myth or refuting the false prophets for profit. That is, the false prophets, for P-R-O-F-I-T, profit. There be five things that I want us to notice. And if you'll notice on your outline on the screen, I've simply simplified it because I discovered in my uh, outlining this that there's so many parts to the puzzle that I didn't want it to be confusing. I want you to hear the main points. And then if you want to take notes, that's wonderful for your own edification in going back and following the message to do your own study. We're going to consider uh, five things. First of all, the precursor of the myth required. The popularity of the myth reviewed. The prophets of the myth revealed. The premise of the myth rejected, and the prophecy of the myth recorded. I want us to notice, first of all, the precursor of the myth required. There are a few things that we must, first of all, understand in biblical understanding. There are a few things that we need to find that is the key that links everything together in relationship to the prophet, prophets and the false prophecies and what's being taught today. To understand biblical truth as God has given it to us in his word, there are two or three things. If I were teaching a hermeneutics class, the word hermeneutics means the uh, art and science of biblical interpretation. If I were teaching a hermeneutics class... I would begin with some of these basic things that I want us to get a handle on so that we'll understand why it is so necessary for us to understand the Word of God. There are two things, basically, that I would uh, start out with in an elementary hermeneutics class and trying to get the students to understand. When I say students, for the most part, they're pastors or those that are serving in some area, some category of ministry, and therefore they need to understand how to understand and interpret the Word of God. We must have, first of all, a systematic hermeneutic, a systematic hermeneutic. That is the uh, understanding of biblical interpretation. What are some of the rules of hermeneutics? Although there are many rules that are required to correctly interpret Scripture, I'm going to give us three basic principles that will apply to every text in every biblical book throughout the Bible in understanding the Word of God. The first thing is the principle of observation. The principle of observation. What does that mean? It means to read, to look at, to examine the text, and what does it say? That's observation. You observe the words. You look at the words. You look at the context. You look at what's being said. That is the principle of observation. Then the principle of interpretation. It's analyze the context. What does it mean in context? Without interpretation based on context, 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 it's a pretext and should never be used for a biblical text. I don't know of a student that I've had in all the years that have come and gone that cannot tell you that I use that phrase in just about every class, that there's a need to understand biblical truth. And the only way you do that is to understand the context, 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 context. 
That is the narrow context in that verse. What does that word say in that verse? The broader context in that uh, paragraph of thought. What does that context word say in the context of that paragraph of thought? And then broadly, what does that word say in the context of that chapter? And then more broadly, what does that word say in the context of that Bible book? And then more broadly, what does that word say in the broad context of all of the Bible? If it is a ver word that is found, if it's a phrase or a statement or an ideology or a theology that is found there in it, if it does not uh, is not confirmed in all of the Bible itself, then there's something wrong, not with God, but with how we understand the text. And therefore, it's vitally important. They will look at the principle of observation and the principle of interpretation. For you see, in 1 Peter 1, verse 20 and 21, God warns us that there's no private interpretation. And yet you have these false, phony, fake gurus that will tell you that they found something that no one else has found. As you'll see in a moment, I'll, I'll point out one of the fake, phony, false pre uh, uh, preachers that said, although I'm not an astronomer, I, I believe I understand something about it. Then he goes on with his yarn about the planets and the planetary uh, movement and what that means, uh, etc. And he says he found that in Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. And we want to refute that because that is the premise and the basis of the false, phony prophecy that's out there today. These false prophets will generally tell you they found something, they've seen something, they understand something that no one else has ever understood before. Uh, there must be an interpretation based on the context, its context of what is being spoken. Is it speaking to Israel or is it speaking to the church? And may I remind us, there's always been, always, always, always God dealing with Israel and God dealing with the church and the church is not Israel. The church is not spiritual Israel. There are thousands of promises in the Word of God. The overwhelming majority belongs to the nation of Israel and not to the church of Jesus Christ. And we need to understand that is vital or we're going to commingle the Scripture. We're going to misunderstand what God is saying in the context of His written, revealed, inspired, infallible, inerrant Word. After observation and interpretation, there must be the principle of application application. Not just what does it say, but how do we apply it? What does it say that's in its context and then how do we apply it in our lives? Why is it necessary to understand the totality of the Word of God? Application must be based upon contextual interpretation and not just some ideological, philosophical, arbitrary methodology. We must have a systematic hermeneutic. Number two, not only a systematic hermeneutic, but a simple chronology. A simple chronology. Example, the rapture is next thing on the calendar of God. After the rapture of the church is the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that uh, return comes after seven years in a minute there where there's seven years of ruin. It is called the seven years of tribulation. There's the three and a half years of tribulation and the three and a half years of great tribulation. The first three and a half years God is dealing with the entire world, with the Gentile world in particular. The last three and a half years, according to my Bible, God's dealing with the nation of Israel exclusively that Israel might say yes to Jesus Christ as Yeshua Messiah and and be brought into the uh, millennial reign with the church age saints and will rule and reign with him for a thousand years. May I remind us, without proper chronology, you can misinterpret or misapply prophetic biblical text. The question then is, in the book of the Revelation, is it past, present, or future in the book of the Revelation? Who is it speaking to? Why is it there? As we look at the book of the Revelation, as I've said before, it's all about seeing the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the uh, apocalypse, the revealing, the making known, the showing forth of the power of God through Jesus Christ and who Jesus Christ really is. We cannot violate God's word just to find some secret meaning found in the stars or the moon or the skies or the planets and then say, we've got the answer to what God is saying. If that's the case, the word of God would be a closed book for the overwhelming majority of the Christian world. And God's word is not a closed book. Scripture interprets scripture. For too many years I've had those say, well, preacher, I don't understand the book of the Revelation. My general question is, have you read the other 65 books? Well, no, I haven't. Well, until you read the other 65 books, you won't understand the 66th book. There's not a word, a phrase, or a symbol in the Revelation text that's not already found someplace in the Word of God that gives us a clear interpretation of that word, a phrase, or symbol that's being used in the book of the Revelation. The precursor of the myth required. Secondly, the popularity of the myth reviewed. First of all, we see sensationalism. 
the prophecy of September the 23rd, 2017, the return of Christ or the world coming to an end is on dozens of internet blogs and pulpits and religious broadcasting. Today, multitudes are concerned, even worried about the future. Mark Belts, B-I-L-T-Z, one of the major authors of the Four Blood Moons, speaking about August the 21st, 2017. and August 21st, 2017 eclipse, in the end of the world, the coming of Christ, September the 23rd, 2017, are commingled and linked together with these false prophets. Speaking of the 20, uh, August 21st, 2017 eclipse, total eclipse, Mark Belt said, We are about to enter the month Elul, the month of repentance. As the church, we have, as a church, we have 40 days to repent before judgment falls. David Mead, just a plain old false prophet. I don't know how I can put it any other way. Said the eclipse heralds the arrival of N-I-B-I-R-U, Nibru, or the Planet X, as he calls it. I mean, I know all of this is coming from intelligent minds, so it's got to be assimilated and believe it, don't we? Listen, <laughs> he says the planet that will crash into the earth on September the 23rd, 2017, leading, a massive de- leading to massive death and destruction at the return of Christ. Eschatology Today, an internet blogger said, and I quote, The sign of Revelation 12 will appear again on on 23rd of September 2017. It foretells of what is to occur during the very near future of the the 70th week of Daniel. It is a sign among all of the other signs which our Lord has given to us to understand his return. Not only do we find the sensationalism, but what I call the sinistricism. Notice, it is so sinister and so uh, mystical as they claim. Revelation chapter 12, they say, is a sign involving the constellation. Listen, a sign involving the constellations uh, Virgo, Leo, the sun, the moon, and the planet Mercury, Mars, Venus, and Jupiter, occurring on September, uh, occurring in September 2017 and will fill, fulfill the purported prophecy of Revelation chapter 12 word for word. Pretty dogmatic, isn't it? Supposedly Virgo, and this is giving you this individual's further explanation, supposedly Virgo, that is the virgin, is the heavenly woman spoken of in Revelation chapter 12 verse 1. The fake, false, phony prophets for prophets tell us that, quote, the woman being clothed with the sun in Revelation 12 and with the moon at her feet makes sense literally when you understand the woman is Virgo and the constellation. Patrick Archibald, the ministry that is called the Renmet, said, and I quote, While I am not an astronomer, astronomer, all my research indicates that the astronomical event in all its particulars is unique in all of man's history. He says, and I quote, <laughs> On November 2016, Jupiter, the king planet, enters into the body, that is the womb, of the constellation Virgo, the Virgin. Jupiter due is uh, retrograde, in its retrograde motion, will spend the next nine and a half months within the womb of Virgo, and after nine and a half months, Jupiter exits out of the womb of Virgo upon Jupiter, that is the exit, that is the birth, on September the 23rd, 2017. We see the constellation Virgo with the sunrise directly behind it, that is the woman clothed with the sun in Revelation 12, at the feet of Virgo, we find the moon, and upon her head we find a crown of 12 stars formed by the unusual nine stars of the constellation Leo with the addition of the planets Mercury, Venus, and Mars. And he concludes with this statement. This is truly remarkable just how this is determined by Revelation chapter 12. End quote. Now that should have been edifying. I had to read it three times to make sure I wasn't misunderstanding what he was saying. The precursor of the myth required. The popularity of the myth reviewed. But I want you to notice the prophets of the myth revealed. And I'll just touch on this because of time. I won't give you any of their major biographical backgrounds. Some of them have no biographical backgrounds other than they're famous for their prophecies that no one else has ever seen or found or heard. Just who are these fake, phony, false prophets 
for profit that we're talking about that occurs in their discussion about September the 23rd, 2017. These also include the ones that he prophesied about August the 21st, 2017, the eclipse, etc., etc. What are some of the superstars? Let me just name some of them. Mark Belts, the prophet, uh, false prophet of the four blood moons. Robert Breaker, B-R-E-A-K-E-R. He's a pastor and missionary. He goes to, to absolute hayseed with a gigantic whiteboard and drawing his line and pointing out these things and and back when Abraham appeared, there was a star that came in the clouds. When Jesus Christ came, there was a star. And now this star of Revelation chapter 12 is appearing that indicates the end of the world, the coming of Christ on September the 23rd, 2017. I thought, Lord, where have I been all my life? <laughs> and there's that Steve Consolati, Discovery Ministries. David Mead, just a plain old false prophet, nothing else I can say. Scotty Clark uh, uh, created the eternal rhythm theory. And then Patrick Archibald uh, with a so-called ministry online called the Renment. And there are many, many others. In fact, it is so broad that it would take uh, a list of 8 to 10, 12, 15 different names for us to understand the broadness and the breadth and the depth of this false prophet, prophecy that's taking place now. Listen very carefully. If we were living in the biblical era and we find a false prophet and what he said does not come true, he's to be taken out to the city gates and stoned to death. That's how serious God takes false prophecies and false prophets. That's the superstars, but what does the scripture say? What is scriptural? Second Timothy 4, 3 and 4 says, For the time will come when they will not endure, that is not listened to, will not put up, will not adhere to, will not tolerate sound doctrine. But after their own lust, cravings and desires shall heap to themselves. That means to accumulate stack upon stack to themselves. Teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. That's myths and false, fake, phony, fiction, prophecies. God warns us of these fake, false prophets and prophecies. In fact, in Jeremiah 5.31, the uh, prophets prophesy falsely and the priests bear, the, bear rule by their means and my people love to have it so. Matthew 7, 15, beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ravening wolves. That is, they're deceitful, they're dangerous, they're destructive, and they're even deadly. Matthew 24, 24 says, for there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall great, show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive even the very elect. Now, the elect of the Old Testament are the Jews, the elect of the New Testament. Every child of God, we're elect of God. And the scripture says, if it were possible even to deceive the very elect. Now let me just do a young blood paraphrase footnote. Any Christian so-called that will believe the false prophecies and the false prophets and all that the gurus have to say year after year after year have a problem with their faith. The faith that falters before the finish had a fatal flaw at the first. If they're able to fall for a false prophet, a false shepherd, and will fall after their voice, there's a problem with their first foremost responsibility of knowing Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord. Some might say, I don't agree with that. That's your prerogative. But I happen to have found down through the years and will believe and teach and preach wholeheartedly that if a person can fall for these fake, false, phony gurus that come and go year after year after year, there is a problem with their fundamental relationship to Jesus Christ. Because it's through a relationship with Jesus that we have the work of the illumination of the Holy Spirit of God. Perhaps you've heard me give the illustration. True illustration. A number of years ago, a theological convention was taking place in a Midwestern city. This eloquently trained, knowledgeable, academic pastor had his uh, friend that was an immigrant that had come in and was pastoring a church. It happened to be an ethnically different church. This young pastor had no theological training. He invited him to go with him to the conference, to the convention. They got there and the house was packed. They could not be seated together. The pastor was on the ground floor and his pastor, young pastor friend had to go up into the balcony. They were separated. During the course of the preaching, an heretical, loose likes lost liberal was in the pulpit. <laughs> and he was preaching biblical heresy. 
He was talking about the word of God could not be trusted. He disavowed, disallowed, disbelieved in the virgin birth. He disavowed, disbelieved everything that we call biblical purity and holiness in the word of God. And this dear pastor that was on the ground floor that uh, loved the Lord, knew the word, and preached the word conservatively. He was worried about his dear brother that was sitting there listening. He's thinking to himself, he's going to hear this and he's going to believe it. So after the program was over and the break time came, they met each other in one of the concourses and he walked up to him and he said, my brother, my brother, I'm so sorry. Uh, what did you, when you heard so-and-so speak, what did you think? What were your thoughts? What did you believe about his preaching? And he stood there very calmly. And he said, as I heard him preach, a voice said to me, lies, lies, it's all lies. <laughs> That's the work of the Holy Spirit of God. That's the work of the Holy Spirit of God that gives us wisdom and insight and direction when we hear false preaching and false teaching and her heretical prophecies that's going out. We need to understand it is false. Matthew 24, 24, for there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible, they shall de deceive even the elect. Matthew 24, 11, and many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. And that word many is the Greek word magos. I'd call it buckets full from the country speak. We must be alert and careful and know the Bible. The word of God is truth. It doesn't contain truth. It is truth. It is the word of God. Then, fourthly, the premise of the myth rejected. The premise. They have a basic premise that they, all of these false prophecies are based on. And that's generally Genesis 1.14. We see the signs. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament and the heavens divide the day and the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. We're told by these false prophets that the text gives them the authority for their predictions and their theories and their myths about the signs. The Greek word, by the way, for signs is the word simeon. It uh, means benchmark, road markers. If you're traveling, you see the benchmarks and the road markers. It says curve ahead, stop ahead, danger ahead, etc., etc. That's what we find with these benchmark, road marks, and uh, so forth in the Word of God that are the signs. May I remind us, it's not some myth or some self-proclaimed theory for false prophets. Scripture will interpret Scripture, as I said earlier. Christians must know God's Word, not what false prophets and prophecies and may, what they may theorize or proclaim that are marketed to the mere babes in awe of some wolf in sheep's clothing. One writer said, and may I quote, Many people believed in the four blood moons based on that rarity of rationale. However, once the last blood moon passed, the theory was relegated to the same trash heap that all invented prophecies and theories do. They all fail to predict, fail to predict anything specific in any specific time or fashion because men cannot accurately predict the future even when improvising from a biblical basis, end quote. That is, you can claim that it's from the Scripture. You can try to twist the Scripture and try to get folks to understand that what you're saying is biblical, and it still does not make it true theologically and biblically. We see the signs, but then we need to understand the Scripture. The rapture is the next thing on the calendar of God for the world. No signs to be fulfilled. Believers are not to see any signs. We're not to be sign seekers, but we're to be sound sensitive. When the trumpet sounds... Do you have your ears tuned to the sound and not looking for some sign in the sky? May I remind us, it's the sound of the trumpet that shall alert every believer. We're to be up, up and away. We're to be out of here, suddenly seized, snatched out via the rapture, the rapturous, the sudden seizing by the Lord Jesus Christ. The uh, ones that are the majority of the so-called signs are based on Jewish festivals and feast days and holy days and holidays and not for the Gentiles according to the Word of God. This is why biblical dispensationalism and biblical hermeneutics are so vital for biblical interpretation. I cannot emphasize it any more or any less. May I remind us, I call these books and these videos and blogs of these false prophets biblical pornography. Here's why. It's enticing. It's alluring. It's addictive. It's dangerous. It's destructive. It's deadly. Why is that so? Because it appeals to the senses. It appeals to the sight. It appeals to the sensationalism that's in the human heart and in the human mind. 
Shame on any Christian that will buy these books and view the blogs or buy their movies and videos using God's money. Uh, why is it uh, impossible to just simply study the Word of God? Jesus Christ himself warns about sign seekers. John 4, 48, then said Jesus unto thee, him except ye seek, see signs and wonders, ye shall not believe. Even when Christ was on the cross, Bring yourself down if you really can. I'm paraphrasing. And then others will believe. Luke 16, the rich man wants somebody to come back, send Lazarus that warned my five brothers of this place. The mindset was, let the supernatural take place. Let someone be raised from the dead to go back and to warn my five brothers. And then if you've been raised from the dead, he or they will believe. If we're unwilling to believe the word of God in context, we're not going to believe if some supernatural, some phenomenal thing were to take place in some fashion and then try to read into it and find a biblical text which makes scripture become scripture rather than being the word of God. The final thing is the prophecy of the myth recorded. So what does Revelation 12 say? Really what does it teach? I want us to notice two things quickly in our time before us. The scriptural text. The scriptural text. Before I look at a few verses in the scriptural text, I want us to understand a few things that brings it to the point and place in Revelation 12. With the sounding of the seventh trumpet found in Revelation, 7, uh, Revelation 11 verse 15, we see the beginning of the second half of the tribulation, the period of Jacob's troubles, as it is called, Daniel's 70th week. In chapters 12 and 13, the cast of players in the great tribulation period is seen. We see Israel as the prominent nation. The nation of Israel is the woman, by the way, that is seen. We see the woman, we see Satan, we see Christ is what we see in Revelation, the 12th chapter. Genesis 3.15, God said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. I shall bruise thy head, and thee shall, thy, thou shalt bruise his heel. These words, I made a little marginal note, these words were a declaration of war, and since then throughout all the carters of human history, all the wars and the battles and the conflicts have been the uh, continuation of the conflict between God and Satan, between good and evil, between Satan and the Savior. Every since then, even the battles that we see from the human standpoint, it's a battle between good and evil. It's a battle between God and Satan. It's a battle between Satan and the Savior. So, the scriptural context or the text, but then there's the scriptural teaching. What does this text teach? We will supply simply what I call a truncated overview of the first few verses. The primary thing that I want to do it's not necessarily exegete all of this text time won't allow. It'd take another hour to do that. But I want us to understand that this text in Revelation 12 is not speaking about some astrological event as the false prophets are saying that will culminate on September the 23rd, 2017. Just a few verses to reveal that it does not teach that as proclaimed by the false prophets. We see the heavenly wonder revealed in the first six verses. The heavenly war recorded in verses 7 through 9. And the heavenly witness recited in verses 10, 11, and 12. I simply want to look at a few of those verses from the biblical perspective of what does it say. For example, in verse 1. In these verses we see two wonders, Simeon signs. The word wonder in the New Testament is 51 times. 48 times it's translated sign. A sign is a fact representing something to come. A sign introduces something with specific absolute meaning according to the word of God. And the scripture says, and there appeared, that is past tense, there appeared a great wonder in heaven. Appeared, that means it comes from the root to see. Literally, there was seen a great woman 
as we look at the text. Who is this woman clothed with the sun of the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars? It's not the Virgin Mary as uh, believed by the Roman Catholic Church. It's not Mary Baker Eddy, the founder of Christian science as she claims it applies to her. It is not the church as is taught by some theologians today. The sign, the wonder is talking about the nation of Israel. Israel, it's out of Israel that Jesus Christ is birthed. And it's as a result of Jesus Christ coming out of the nation of Israel that Satan hates Israel. In fact, as I preach the totality of the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation, I talk about why Israel, why the Jew is so hated. And it's because out of Judaism, out of Israel, that the Savior, Yeshua, Messiah, came into the world. And Satan hates Jesus, and he hates the nation of Israel. May I remind us, not only the sign, but I want you to notice, first of all, the state characterized here. Israel, in verse 1 and 2, the nation of Israel. In fact, in Isaiah 54 and verse 1, it portrays Israel as a married woman. The church is the chaste bride of Christ, so it's not talking about the church. Her description is found here. Clothed with the sun, that talks about brilliance and splendor on the global scene. And the moon under her feet, it is talking about the uh, permanence of survival and stability. Upon her head, a crown that is a Stephanos. It's talking about the crown of uh, supremacy and success and the crown of 12 stars. It is not talking about the constellation as these gurus would try to have someone. Listen very carefully. If that were the case, who in the name of God in a biblical church would ever understand the uh, biblical record of Revelation, the 12th chapter. You'd have to be an astronomer or have someone in the pulpit that is an astronomer to be able to teach what it says. It would suppose some secret underlying uh, words that you don't understand. It would propose some secret underlying theological understanding of the biblical text. We see the picture of Israel and all of her splendor and survival and supremacy and strength. This is how God sees Israel. Verse 2, you see what I call not only her description, but her delivery. And she being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. These gurus do not even touch on verse 2 in their supposed interpretation of the sign. They simply go back to that verse 1 and make all of their yarn developed out of a portion of verse 1 out of context without any understanding of the full text that is before us, especially in the unit of thought, which would be the first 12 verses of understanding. And she being with child crying, travailing at, uh, in birth and pain to be delivered. She gives birth in verse 5 as we see. Israel will be the light bearer of the gospel during the tribulation days with 144,000 uh, male virgins and Jewish evangelists preaching the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ. It was Israel that gave the world Jesus Christ. The first wonder is the state of Israel. And I could go further if time would allow. Let me simply suffice it to say we're living in a day when it is so needful for Christians to be found faithful under the conservative proclamation of the Word of God yes. in context, yes. without any pretext, without any additive, without taking away or adding to the Word of God. Here's one writer that says this. September the 23rd, 2017 will come and go without the Antichrist manifesting on that specific date, without the uh, uh, abomination of desolation occurring on that date, without the Great Tribulation starting on that date, without any rapture, without any planet X or planet Nebru, or without any major war starting on that date, and without any of the other prophecies being fulfilled of so-called September 23rd, 2017. Yet the false prophets who are predicting major prophecies for 20, uh, September 23rd, 2017 will not repent because they have never repented of the great multitude of false prophecies that they have de uh, deceived the people for many years. Yet people will continue to follow their websites, their YouTube channels, because the people are so gullible, and it's so sad. 
if people would get saved and receive the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ and study the Bible and think spiritually, they will not so easily be led astray by these false prophecies that do not align with anything in the Holy Scriptures as it is taught. A second writer says this. Instead of setting dates, we ought to be ready for his return at any moment. Are you ready? What sort of prophetic event is this sign supposed to usher in? Clearly, most people promoting this uh, false prophecy have in mind the Lord's return. Some explicitly state that, others mindful of the word of God in Matthew twenty-four thirty-six, are hesitant to make that claim. Though their implication is very clear, these sort of claims or intimations have been made many times before. For instance, the four lunar eclipses during 2014 and 15 caused many people to anticipate the Lord's return and Lord's return then. But of course, this did not happen. I suspect that the same will be true of September 23rd this year. The people will get excited, get excited about the supposed signs, miss the point that Jesus made in Matthew 24, 36 and following. Instead of setting dates, we ought to be ready for his return at any moment. Are you ready? Is the question. May I remind us, we live in serious days, days when we need to be learning more about the Word of God, days and times when we need to be more acutely aware of what the Scripture says. And yet we're living in, let me use a President Trump term, we're living in the swamp of false prophecies, false theologies, and false doctrines. I would urge us to be very careful. We ought to be Berean Christians. Study the word to see if what's being said be true. Every child of God has that responsibility. And in the study of the word, it's going to cause us to be and prompt us to be ever aware, more acutely aware of our need to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ while we yet have an opportunity. Would you stand please as we stand together, every head bowed and every eye closed, as the music plays, as the Holy Spirit of God speaks. Take my life and let it be. 